welcome to Tub Talks with Damon. My special guest today is Tony winning, Pulitzer Prize winning, Michael R. Jackson. Hey Damon, how's it going? <laughs> How are you, Michael? I'm good. This is like, I feel like I'm on um, Playboy After Dark Ooh, in the mid-90s or something. Like Hefner time. Right, yeah. I like that. I like that. Well, I'm so honored and really appreciative for this opportunity to talk with you about your life, your art, your work. Um, but I'm really excited about this interview. Yes, How are yes. you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. I've never done anything like this in my life, so I'm excited. Okay. Yeah. Is it feeling weird? No. Yeah, I know it's sort of a weird concept, but you know, like once we're actually sitting in here, it sort of feels yeah. yeah. No, I'm like literally like Playboy after dark. Like that's, <laughs> like that's the vibe I'm getting. All right, at the at the at the Williamsburg Mansion. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. So, Michael, I have so many questions for you about your work, about your life, about your thoughts, about your activism. But before uh -huh. we get to that, I want to know, what do you like most about your body? So, I knew you were going to ask me this, and I'm, like, still pondering. Like, my journey with my body is an ongoing one, but I guess I would say... One part of my body that I really like is my ass. Yes, tell me more. I don't know. It's like it's uh, it's uh, prominent. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's noticeable. It's you know, I feel good about it. I don't know. I don't. I don't have like a long history with that, but I like that. Yeah, I like that. Was has that been a journey to appreciate? Your ass. Yeah, I mean, because I think I've always been like, you know, particularly being uh, like a gay man coming of age, getting now in my, approaching my mid 40s. I've always been like a little like body conscious and like, oh, I need to lose weight and all this stuff or whatever. And, and like, my ass is like, you know, it's, it's part of my, Ba 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 boom, you know. Uh -huh. And I didn't always appreciate that, but I think like it's something that as I've gotten older, I'm like, yeah, this is your body. And it's your like, power. It's my power. Yeah. How did you come to appreciate? Like, how did it go from feeling one way to appreciating your ass as, as something empowering? I mean, I think like many years of therapy. I think working on a strange loop. You know, and just sort of living life, getting older, sort of coming to appreciate, you know, who I am as a person, I'm like, it's sort of like a symbol, like it's the biggest symbol of my body. Like it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing that I like sit on and that I sort of, everything sort of oriented around it. I put one leg, one hands on one leg at a time and those pants shape around my posterior. Great. So, do you do you get compliments on that? Uh, not. I mean, in I mean, I have gotten compliments. I wouldn't say that it's like an everyday thing, mm -hmm. but you know, every once in a while. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So yeah, feel free to move around. Yay. So let's start with you know I think I was. I don't even have to do research for this interview because I right. love your work and I listen to A Strange Loop all the time. And I'm going to be getting your new soundtrack that mm -hmm. just came out, White Girl in Danger. Right. But I feel like there's so many things about your work and sometimes about you personally that you communicate right. through your music and through your storytelling. I think if I had to think of one line that conveys a theme is, I'm into entertainment that's undercover art. Mm -hmm. And... The first time I heard that, I was like, ooh, um, I'm into entertainment that's undercover art. Would you say that is in a, sort of a through line throughout your, your artistic journey? I think so. You know, um, I am somebody who always, who's sort of interested in high and low culture in art. And I think sometimes there's like work out there that's very sort of heady and intellectual and some work out there is just like purely for entertainment and I like sort of all of it. And so for me, one of my um, 
goals and sort of missions, and part of my mission as an artist has been to fuse sort of something that is sort of pleasurable and fun and accessible, but also that has some weight to it. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I sort of, how I try to approach everything that I make. And so I, how did Strange Loop come about? How did it evolve? So it started off as a monologue that I uh, started writing right after I graduated from undergrad in 2002, three, um, that I, I had like was living in the middle of nowhere in Jamaica, Queens, um, in this bungalow style uh, house above this little old lady and named this Ruby. And I was like, had no idea of what I was going to do with my life with a BFA degree. I didn't know, um, like literally, like the world was in kind of a crazy place. Like the Iraq war was about to start. Like there were people with like machine guns, like in the subways, if you remember back in those days. And I just was sort of like, what world am I in? How am I going to make a living? What, like what's, what will become of me? And so I started writing this monologue called Why I Can't Get Work, which was just like a stream of consciousness monologue about being like a young black gay man walking around New York City, wondering why life is so terrible. And, um, and it sort of, from there, it was just gonna be that monologue. But then I went to grad school like the next year for musical theater writing at NYU and I began learning how to write songs, and I started writing some of those songs that had a thematic overlap with the monologue, and then I started putting some of the songs into the monologue, and then that began this, the, the, that began the looping, the looping of the loop. What uh, was that like for you to be able to transform your fears and concerns into music? It was really, cathartic and also it felt like I was doing something like I was making sense of the world in some way that like I had control of something like because I think that was the biggest thing at that point was I felt like I didn't have control of anything and the only way I could feel in control was if I could write something down or or make something out of it and so it felt really good to be able to do that wow now the play in many ways breaks so many almost barriers or taboos. It reveals a thread of racism within the gay community. It reveals homophobia in the black religious community. It really draws upon these different groups and talks about some of the um, prejudices within these groups. Yeah, but I think that there's something about that that I always sort of want to highlight for people is that it does show those things but you also you also have to remember that those things are internal those are like that's all it's all happening in usher's mind so a lot of it is a perception that isn't but like when you perceive something to be true it's true whether it's actually true or not mm -hmm. and so that for me is the line that the show really walks is that usher is like having these feelings but some of those feelings are, are self-induced. Well, and I guess- But they're, they're self-induced because they're coming from, there's external, uh, it's coming from without, as much from without as it is from within. Right. It's like, that's the loop. Like it's, it's self-perpetuating. Once you get one sort of negative feedback loop, it just, you do the rest of the work. Right, so I think what the play does is really illustrate that so much of the self-loathing Mm -hmm. and pain is derivative of the voices or in the play That's they're right. called the thoughts That's right. and his extra his his actual experience is reflecting that the um the things people say to him on grinder mm -hmm. the sort of mean well, and cruel yeah but i guess i would make. say it perhaps like if you were to interview usher uh -huh. about his actual way uh -huh. he might say it happened one time uh -huh. But the one time it happened might as well have been a million times. Mm. And so the thoughts replicate. And, and he, he's doing a lot of 
he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting of, of those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Even if like it happened just once in life or whatever. Interesting. Or if he had like, you know, an experience with his parents, like that might have happened a handful of times or a bunch of times or whatever, but like he's now doesn't live with them and he's doing the rest of the work in the play, in the musical, in his life of like of amplifying the negative messages that he's gotten from home, church, wherever. It's interesting because it really brings into what we call both the um, the inner world, mm -hmm. the day-to-day -day experience we have as individuals, but also the macro world, the right. systems. Yeah. Because these are, you know, the racism in the gay community, the homophobia in the religious community. Right. These are very real systemic messages that are insidious. They, they are real, but I also think... And this is like sort of like touches on you know a lot of people ask me about me Michael R Jackson's relationship to a strange loop, mm -hmm. and the thing I always have to share with them is that so Usher is eternally twenty five going on twenty six, I am now forty three in January I'll be forty four the year after that I'll be forty five so a lot of my perspectives on on Usher and his life they sort of change because I sort of. I can see things that he can't see. Um, such as? Such as that, like, when he... So one thing that he does in the show is that he, he talks about, for example, racism in the gay community. Mm -hmm. But the thing that he... And the thing he doesn't talk about... Well, he mentions it in his monologue at the end. Is that there's a lot of people who fixate on that, but they don't talk about their hyper-desire for, like, white men, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. And so, like, those two things can coexist that like there are there is can be sort of discrimination in you know sex and dating but there also can be a fetishization that is going both directions right so the fetishization that some black men may have for white men which mm -hmm. may put them in situations where they're where being they fetishized accept, yeah, and, exploited. And, they, and they might not like it but they'll accept it or some of them might like it there are some black men who are like all about that kind of race play and that sort of thing and there's some who are not about it, but feel that that's all that they deserve. And then there's some who are like, that. I'm not down for that. It's like a whole range of experience. Where have, have you fallen in that range? I, uh, in, when I was younger, in my 20s, my experience was that I would uh, accept it, but I did not like it. Because at that time, I had like a much lower self-esteem and was sort of like, this is not what I signed up for, but it's all I can get is how I felt, like, as a younger person. Whereas now, I'm like, fuck that. I'm not doing that. Right. Now you, what's the difference today? Well, I just have more confidence, and I'm more, um, I'm more certain about what I will not stand for. Okay. And, like, what's... What is it you will not stand for today? I won't stand for being degraded in any way, racially or otherwise. Like, I'm, I'm really wanting, uh, mutually satisfying uh, experiences. So if someone is disrespectful to you or treats you the way the partner does in um, Inwood Daddy. Yeah, that would never happen. You would not put up with that. Never. Was that based on a real experience? It was drawn from a real experience that I'd had that wasn't exactly like that, but it was how, what it felt like. And at that time, I didn't have the confidence to extricate myself from that situation. Mm -hmm. And so then I felt like the whole thing was my fault. Um, as like a, but I was like a young 20-something and I didn't know any better. And I also didn't have any mentors or people I could talk to about those things, which I think is another aspect of sort of the gay ex male experience particularly, but I'm sure for others, is that like, if you don't, if you don't have like those mentors or those sort of like other gay friends who can sort of like help you through those moments, like it's sort of, I was like very much on my own for like all of it. So for all the twenties, when you were exploring your sexuality yeah. and finding your desire, you were, you didn't really have a mentor to help you no, learn not how to all. avoid being exploited or Correct. disrespected. Not at all. And especially because I had come from, you know, I came from like a predominantly black city and background, and so I came to the melting pot in New York. And so like, in New York, everything is fast, 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 here today, gone tomorrow. Um, and so there wasn't 
there just wasn't anybody for me to turn to. So I had to figure everything out on my own. Wow. Yeah. Do you feel like it's any different today? Do you feel like young people, young people of color, queer people of color have more mentors or guidance today? Um, you know, I, I don't really, I don't know the answer to that, but, and it's hard to say because so much of the world today is about what's on your phone and social media and like sort of digital, digital community. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just, that's totally different from when I was yeah. younger. And so I don't know what younger gay or queer people, like I don't know how they even feel about, how they even feel about the issues. So what, I've been wanting to ask you this since I saw Strange Loop. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, um, Usher mentions in the final song, Strange Loop, white gay male tyranny. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, you know, when I was in my 20s and Usher was in his 20s, I, like, and again, I came from, like, a black city into what I lovingly or, or, cri or critically called the gay triarchy. The white gay man, gay, yeah, white gay the gay triarchy. It just, yeah. it's a social scene of being a gay man in New York City, particularly when I was coming of age as a young, you know, because a young 20 something, was very white and it was very um, whatever white gay men were sort of into. Um, or that's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. Because again, there's all kinds of communities everywhere who, that you could be a part of and you don't have to be you know, in the in crowd or whatever. But at that time, I felt like if I was going to be a successful gay man, I sort of had to um, fit into this kind of white gay world, which was also at the same time sort of fighting to be, for equality. But that equality, again, was more white. Like, it was a complicated thing. And, and as a young person, I just thought, like, I have to fit into this. But I didn't fit into it, and there wasn't anybody to, to really untangle the, the complexity of that. And so it just meant I sort of ran into a lot of mistakes, into a lot of trying to fit a square peg into a round hole for a long time. So that the dominant idea in Manhattan twenty Sorry. years ago. That's my dad. Grand. You're saying your experience was that it was like white gay men you know. kind of determining the norms. Yeah, yeah, and like what was popular, what was, popular. what was like, what you know, what you should look like, and what this, what social groups you would be a part of, and the shoulds. The sh yeah, and like yeah. where you where you would go to clubs and how you talk to people and who was in, who was out, who was hot, who was not, all that stuff, which does like a number on your self-esteem, especially if you don't, if you don't have like a strong foundation for, for like who you are, particularly as a gay man in a world that at that time was like a little more hostile than it is today. So is it less hostile now? I would say so. I mean, but I also think that the world today is, in some ways, feels a little more soulless. Like, it's not as... It, like, I used to... Like, I feel like gay men and, and queer people used to be more anti-establishment mm -hmm. and, and less conformist. And now, I think in part because of the sort of digital revolution, things are a lot more cookie cutter and conformist than they were when I was younger, even though then it was harder because you were on the outside. We were more on the outside. So you were on the outside, early 20s, and trying to fit into this world in New York that was, you know, sort of dominated culturally by white men. Mm -hmm. And you were describing being attracted to white men, but sometimes not. No, I mean, it's hard to say that I, was I attracted? I mean, I wasn't not attracted to white men, but that wasn't. I didn't have. I didn't really have a, a, a total sense of my desires at all. So I was very much floating wherever the wind would blow me. 
because to to sit and really think about my own desires was not part of the equation. And that was like a part, of, and that was, was a big part of the work that I had to do, you know, over many years of being like, oh, right, you actually, your own desire for your own life is like important. And it's not about fitting into a mold. Yes. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. That that became the transformation yeah, yeah. for you to claim and own your desire. Yeah, I mean, it took a minute. It took yeah. a long minute. But, well, and then again, Exile and Gayville describes for Usher that and, experience then of reaching out and being ignored and dismissed and yeah, lost. And, but also recognizing that he, that, I, that he's angry about it. That, like, he's doing it, but he's not, like, happy about it. He's like, this is bullshit. I hate it. And, and I take that song, the title of that song um, comes from, it's a play on Exile and Guyville, yeah. the Liz Fair album, which is about her being a young woman in a male-dominated sort of music scene and dating these men and, and them all sort of patting her on the head and making her feel like she had to conform to whatever their feelings, desires, tastes, etc. And like when I listened to that album, it really resonated with me even though she was talking about a different dynamic. I was like, this is how I feel being like a black gay man in a sort of white gay dominated social scene of like, oh, you're... Um, you know, you're at the bottom of a food chain. And I, like, hated that feeling, but I also was, like, I was gonna, I was also trying to be a part of it at the same yeah. time. Watching the show, I thought, how am I part of the, today, and this, you know, I've lived in Manhattan almost 20 years as a white gay man. How am I perpetuating the white gay tyranny that you and many others have described? Well, I, I guess I, this is also another place where I'm, like, I've grown apart from Usher on this issue a little bit because I think that that's the tyranny is is sort of in your own internalization of it because now I'm like I don't care what white gay men do mm-hmm. like I mean when I say that like as a as a as a group as a social yeah. You released like, yeah, like I'm power like I'm like I'm, I'm like oh like some of them I'm attracted to some of them I'm not I don't feel a need to be a part of any scene and in fact a lot of times when I go into like for example a friend of mine and his husband had a house on Fire Island that I went to like two summers ago and I hadn't been to Fire Island since like ten years prior to that and I remember the first time I went to Fire Island I felt very intimidated by it because it was such a like it's like it's such a pressure cooker of all of the the gatriarchy mm-hmm. as I call it yeah. but like this time I still felt some of it because it's such a highly charged sexual but like sexual by way of like a capitalist kind of like grind meat grinder that I, I felt a little intimidated by it but I also felt like this is not my scene like, and I was, like, able to be there and, like, have a good time with my friends and, like, enjoy being, like, a nice house and in and, and their pool and, like, whatever. But I was, like, and then we, like, went to this one party. There's, like, some party that was happening there where, like, people were, like, having sex in the laundry room and stuff. And I was, like, and that's fine. But I was, like, oh, this is not, this is literally not for me. And in, like, a, it's, I'm not judging it per se, but... It's not, I don't feel like, I feel neither included nor excluded from it. Yeah. And I sort of like, I could participate in it or I could not participate in it. Um, and that's not how I felt in my 20s. In my 20s, I felt like, I am garbage. I don't belong here. Uh, why can't I be more like them? Blah, 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 blah. And now I'm like, nah, no good. So in your 40s has really been about taking back your power, not giving power to other people's decisions. What the yeah, and, and, where and they're honestly fucking. being like okay with myself and just yeah. being like, and, and not minding my own company uh-huh. and not needing to, needing other people's approval mm. or, but, and, and accepting that that might mean that I'm a loner, which I've always been kind of a loner and like, and I don't mind my own company. I love hearing that. How have you... So so you've been used to being a loner, being a solo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. 
um, and, and really breathing into that, being comfortable with that has helped you navigate all these other spaces. That's right. And sort of change the, the loop in your and, own life. Yeah, you know, and I just like, there's just some stuff I just won't put up with. Yeah. And there's just some, I just like, you know, I, there's this expression in, in sort of black parlance that is, um, I can do bad enough by myself. Yeah. And that's sort of how I feel. I'd rather do bad enough by myself than to like, sub like allow myself to be subjugated or to compromise my own sort of values for somebody else. Wow. I love that. And in my um, therapeutic head, I think of that as releasing the shoulds. Right. It's interesting, you know, tyranny of the shoulds was an essay that was written in the 50s. Mm -hmm. So when I hear gay male tyranny, I, that's where my mind automatically goes to. My whole thing as a therapist is helping people challenge and change the shoulds right. that are harming them or hurting them in some way. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like that has been part of your journey is to, you know, just say release the, the internal shoulds or the things that are harming you or keeping you down and really own your power, own right. your value, yeah, yeah. your light. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's, so, was prep part of that journey at all? No, because I'm just like not, <laughs> it's funny, like I was talking, I went to my physical last year. Uh -huh. I was talking to my doctor about it. And the truth is, I'm just not sexually active enough to like necessitate being on prep, I don't think. Although he told me, you don't have to be, like, right, you don't I have don't to know. take it daily. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know. Maybe it's something I need to revisit, but. We can talk about it. Because you don't have to take it daily. There, yeah. There's a effective way to take it where you would just do it if you might be, if you were going to it or going yeah, in a situation but my, where you might but, be. But my, my might be is so rare that, uh -huh. like, I'm like, do I need to do this, this sort of pharmaceutical intervention? Like, also, like, in a U equals U world. Like, it's, there's a lot of things to to balance and to think about. Uh -huh. And I just haven't, I haven't felt the need for it. Okay. Well, and I love that that's a choice. And that's what my work with PrEP is about, is making sure people just know their choices. Mm -hmm. One of the choices you have, if you so choose, is just to have a bottle somewhere in your house. Right. So if you did decide to use it on demand or for a event, right. you would have that option. But, I, but isn't it once you sort of begin that cycle, you're supposed to like go get regular checkups every six months and all that. It is recommended, but yeah. if you're only using it on demand and you're only right. using it like once or twice a month or even less, right. you know, you're, you and your provider would talk about sure. a, a testing strategy that would work best for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a feeling like for me, again, because of my kind of won't put up with like, I, I think I'm very highly selective mm -hmm. at this point that it, I, I, I'm just, I'm just, I think the other thing is that like, I'm, I, the, what I, a lesson I've learned after much trial and error is that I'm not, I'm not built for casual sex. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not, it's not, it doesn't bring me pleasure the way that I would like it to because it's just too... Random. Like, I had this experience where I recently went to the cock for, like, a crazy night. And I had never done that before. And I, and I was telling a friend about it, but it felt like um, there was so much activity that in my life, it felt like I was asked to go on with not, without any um, rehearsal for, like, a musical. And I was like, be here, be here, all this blocking is how I felt about it. And I was like, and I, was like I don't like that. I like to know what's going on and know like who I'm dealing with, what's up, what's what are you into, what am I into, what are we doing? I mean, with you know, room for exploration, but like I don't need all these people in and out, you know, like um, or me in and out. Like I don't need that. That and that makes me feel actually more anxiety because I'm like, what am I doing? Like it feels like a. It, I felt like I was literally like on, like I was like on stage mm. and that doesn't, that doesn't, that's not pleasurable for me. Yeah, I get it. And again, I think that's the beautiful thing about discovery is we learn what we like and what we don't like. We right. say yes to our yes, no to our no, and maybe to yeah. our maybe right. to find out and learn. When you go to a place now like the cock, do you get recognized? I didn't this time, I don't think. I mean, no one told me they recognized me, but I find that on the little bit of like app world, people are often recognizing me, which is a little annoying. But like, 
So, I don't know. It's a balance. Sometimes I think I need to just move to a small town. Where like nobody knows me. No. <laughs> Sorry, but you are a Tony winning Pulitzer. So yeah, 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 I might yeah. get recognized. But the reason I was asking about prep is because you were, and I think, I'm pretty sure, the very first artist to include prep oh, yeah, yeah, in a yeah, song yeah. that you shared with me, right. remember, 11 years ago, yeah, yeah. Um, when you were starting to write, the, compose the music, right. and Second Wave mm -hmm. was a song you performed here in New York, mm -hmm. and it was like, you talk about Travada, and, right. and I just love that. I thought, And that was still early on, that was 2013, right. before yeah, people yeah. really knew. I love that you had incorporated that into the narrative of the yeah. song about second wave feminism. Yeah, we actually, so Strange Loop is going to be in LA in June, and uh, Gilead is one of the sponsors uh -huh. of the production, I believe. So we're doing like a talk back night. Oh, wow. Sponsored by them. Oh, cool. Uh, so. Okay. So tell them that the, you know, original Travada horse said Michael Jackson was the first person to incorporate Travada. Well, yeah, well. although I was talking about it from a very sort of um, ambivalent place. Right. But like what I did, I was interested in the idea of it. Right. And again, art is a way of educating right. and connecting. You know, undercover art is, yes. is helping people. And I think that song and all the performances and then through Strange Blue mm -hmm. help people become familiar and normalize. That's true. Travada That's true. and Pratt. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so let's, like, just do the Tyler Perry thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, so Strange Loop sort of savagely satirizes Tyler Perry um, stage plays and movies and sort of... Um, in this sort of conversation about black art and what uh, is expected of black artists, particularly writers, um, which is a topic that I have been long obsessed with, you know, because I've been a writer for a long time. And uh, I've wanted to explore it because, like, you know, my mom's a big fan of Tyler Perry. I know lots of big Tyler Perry fans, and something that often would be said to me over the years, or used to be back in the old days, was, oh, Tyler writes real life. And I always was so confused by that, because I would watch his work, and I'm like, this is anything but real life. So what is it that people are looking for in this work, and why should other black artists um, replicate it? Again, kind of like a should you were under right. a pressure as an artist to be like him. Yeah, yeah. What is it? I mean, I, I believe that. I love Strange Loop. But can you just say, like, what is the problem with Tyler Perry's work? I mean, I don't know if it's for me to say that there's a problem other than it's... He, he writes in a way that is really... Um, messy and like it's it just dramaturgically it often doesn't hold together and it's sort of like broad stereotypes but then the writing of those broad stereotypes often doesn't add up it's like very based on a kind of religious underpinning that then also doesn't add up it's just like it's and here's the thing like i feel like his work is so popular that it's worth it's like can stand up to scrutiny mm -hmm. of like and but like but what's interesting is that a lot of people don't want to put it under scrutiny because they just want to like it. And I'm like, you're allowed to like it, but I'm actually have seen a lot of it, so I'm just analyzing it the way I would anything else. Yeah. Um, but it's it's there. It's out it's in the there. public. It's there to be critiqued. Yeah, he's a, he's a, and can it be critiqued and appreciated? Right. It? But like, but there's just this weird thing where because he's like a black, successful billionaire person that like you shouldn't criticize the quality of it because the, the fact that he's doing it is more important. And I don't subscribe to that. I think that like what makes black art enduring is if you can sort of like poke at it. So people have criticized my work in all kinds of ways. And I think that my work is better for that. It means that it actually matters, that it has some sort of something to it that people can like poke and prod at it. Yeah. Whether they like it or don't like it. I mean, in some ways, I think that's a sign of respect, yeah. is to critique 
and poke at someone who has created yeah. art that is popular. But he does not see it that way. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> what is what his he, response? I mean, so he called me right after I won the Pulitzer to... 2020. In 2020 yeah. to congratulate me on the sort of historic, quote-unquote historic nature of the win. But he also sort of jokingly said that he was going to beat my ass if he ever saw me. Because he, like, doesn't... Like, I, my read on him is that he has a kind of thick, thin skin... And it doesn't want to be criticized, which I understand. But I'm also like, you have like millions and millions and millions of dollars and so many fans. Why does like one random playwright in New York City like get under your skin so much? Um, and we've like had respectful back and forths over, over the phone. I've never met him, mm-hmm. and he's never seen a strange loop, which is also the other funny part of it to me, that like he has made he made a comment about it in the Hollywood Reporter, but I was like, you didn't see it, so you don't know what it is. Do you think he's heard the I'm sure the people music? I think he's he he's texted me um uh a screenshot to show me he had bought the album, the off Broadway album. Okay. But did he listen to it? Maybe, maybe not. Did he understand it? Did he care? Did he think about it? What are his opinions? But it's like like he could have he could have like engaged with it meaningfully, but if, I don't think it like it really occurred to him to do so. If he had, then I think he would hear in the song Tyler Perry Writes Real Life is that there's an argument. There's a debate. There is an argument, and the funny thing about it is that Tyler Perry Writes Real Life is not actually the song that he should listen to. He should uh-huh. listen to the song that comes after it uh-huh. called Writing a Gospel Play. Uh-huh. Because that's the one where oh, Usher yeah, that actually one. is doing an imitation of what Usher perceives these plays to be about. Which is hysterical but right you know and again like you can feel he can feel mad about it but it's also like it's just it was no different than like a comedy roast Mm -hmm. and like comedy roasts are like usually done for people who have achieved a certain level where they can take it yeah and i for me i don't understand why he couldn't just like if nothing else, view it on that level. Because then, because also the rest of the play is not even about him. Uh-huh. Which again, if he like came and saw it, he would realize that. But I think he's too scared. What would you have hoped his reaction would have been? I mean, I just, I just thought, just come and see it. Even if you hate it, just come and see it. And then that's the end of it. And then like, if you want to criticize me after you see it, then go for it. So, well, I mean, there's still hope because it's still touring. He still might see it. I don't think so. Yeah. I, think, I think he has too thin of a skin. Like, I, I just, I don't, I don't think it will happen. And that's okay. Yeah. I, I hope, you know, I would hope that he and anyone who feels challenged by this piece I mean, would see it. I mean, we'll, I guess what I'll be curious, like, if somebody ever licenses it, uh-huh. Um, in Atlanta. Uh-huh. And it'll be like in his backyard. Do you think Beyonce's Maybe. seen it? What? Has Beyonce seen it? No. Because oh, she's, there's a few, a no, few no. days at her. And she, no. She, no. Not at her, but just, no, no, not no, no, no. at Beyonce, but at the, sort of the, the pop culture terrorism yeah, around mean, the beehive. I mean, and also that was a joke that I stole from Bell Hooks. So, uh-huh. Um, it, it, there's like so many things in a strange loop that are just like, you know, the position that I took as the author and that Usher takes as the author are that, like, we're from the position of being an outsider. Yeah. So everything, all the little, you know, shots that are fired are at people who are, like, insiders. Yeah. The Goliaths. Yeah, the Goliaths. So, yeah. like, that's just what it is. Yeah. And I think that that's okay. Yeah. So then the play comes off. There were a lot of delays with COVID, but the play right. goes forward and you start getting the awards, the right. I don't the drama, the New York League, the uh, the Tony, the Pulitzer. You went from being that David outsider to getting accolades and mm-hmm. accolades. Tell me, Michael, what right. was that like for you? It was weird. I mean, it was great, but it was also weird because, you know, I feel like the same person who was like a 23 year old in some ways. I mean, like I, my, my attitude toward it was that like, it was really nice, but I, it wasn't, I didn't feel like I was entitled to it. Like I thought it was like a lovely and cool recognition from other people that they thought 
my work had any value. But I also had to look at it of like, I still feel a little critical of like a lot of the world around us, but it's like a nice ride to be on. Did it change the way you feel about yourself? I, I don't, I mean, maybe it gave me a little bit more confidence that I was an artist who had something to say and that was worth hearing, but I don't think it like, I, it didn't make me feel fundamentally any different. Mm -hmm. Like, cause I'm also like not an artist who has ever um, sought fame or anything or like thought like, ooh, one day I'll be famous and how great that will be. Cause like, I feel some of that from other people when they talk to me and I always am like, this is so weird. Like the other day I was at um, the Whitney Museum and I got off the elevator, I was with a friend and this woman came right up to me right as I jumped off the elevator and she goes, I'm obsessed with you. And my response was like, oh, like I was like, cause I don't know, do you have a knife? Do you have a gun? Like, who are you? Why are you saying that to me? <laughs> are you from Tyler Perry? <laughs> or where are you from, where are you from like this? Who are you? You know, yeah. there's a lot of crazy people in New York City. So, yeah. but she just wants to say that she loves a strange loop. And like, and I get that a lot, like ever, like a lot, especially here in the city. And I appreciate it, but I don't ever go like, oh, my fan. Oh, thank you, dear fan. Like, I'm not, I don't, I'll never have that attitude. Did it make your life any harder or difficult? Um, I, I don't, I don't think that I could characterize it that way, even if there are moments when it might be like a little annoying. Because at the end of the day, a strange loop has brought me a lot of opportunities and money, and like, and I have like a com more comfortable life than I had when I was a 23 year old scrambling through New York City. So I can't complain about anything too much. But, you know, but there are sometimes moments when I'm like, oh, God, like, this is too much stuff, you know, that, that they always say, you know, more money, more problems. Mm -hmm. And that's true. I know that for some people who do crave fame and attention when they're young and don't have the infrastructure to handle it, once they get it, if they get it, once they get it, their world is kind of shattered because they still feel very empty inside. Right. And then they turn to, you know, drugs or escapes. And, to, this, and, hurt and that's another reason why I'm really grateful that a strange loop didn't hit until I was in my late thirties. Because if it had hit when I first started writing it for some reason, as a young 20 something with all the stuff that I talked to you about now today, like, I would not have been able to handle it. I would have been extremely susceptible to all kinds of predation and, um, and ego stuff that, like, would have made, like, would have been really bad for me. Yeah. Did it put pressure on you as an artist to create the next masterpiece? Yes. So that's, I mean, that's the, I will say that's the one, like, really bad part is that Strange Loop was such a, a phenomenon that like it, it it's what everyone thinks of with me like it's hard to sort of move and do a new piece or do something else because everything is always going to be in the shadow of it but this is like a very common sophomore issue you know with a lot of artists who come out with like a big piece and then their next one it'll kind of never measure up no matter what you do yeah and, but, and so, I, but again, I just sort of had to accept that and like, and just continue to be the artist that I wanted to be. Yeah. So let's talk about what came next. Yeah. White Girl in Danger. White Girl in Danger. So talk to me about, about how that came about and, and what the inspiration was for that. So White Girl in Danger is a satirical musical set in a soap opera town that, uh, was an idea that I came up with kind of as a joke when I was in grad school because I grew up watching soap operas and Lifetime movies and Monday Night movies and that sort of thing that was more popular back in the 80s and 90s. And um, I was obsessed with this idea that there were all of these like white women, exclusively white girls and women who were in all these movies and TV shows 
they always were like in trouble, either in their own making or because of someone else. And that, that, that like, I had this recognition that as a little kid watching soap operas, I sort of grew to understand who is important by watching these stories and the way that they put these white girls and women in some sort of peril. And so I came up with this idea for, a, like, it was just going to be a, a spoof of, for the show called White Girl in Danger, which to me summed up what all of these stories were, where I just imagined a woman who looked and sounded like Nell Carter going, White girl in danger! She's doing drugs, but she won't do her homework! You know, and that was just, it was just going to be <laughs> that kind of spoof. Yeah. But then what happened was, in a, like 2015, I noticed that there started being all of these sort of cultural conversations about representation, equity, diversity, inclusion, etc. And I started to listen to these conversations and think about my own feelings as a Black writer who was always sort of putting Black people in stories and wondering, like, what does it mean to be included? And suddenly, that question in white girl in danger, she's doing drugs, she's doing drugs, she's doing her homework, sort of came together to make H2O, you know? Wow. And it's, I love it because, you know, we also share a love of soap operas growing up, watching them as kids, teenagers, college students, you know, and, and for me it was the NBC lineup right. that really treated black characters, especially black women, <laughs> as interchangeable. You know, like, Abe on Days of Our Lives rarely had a girlfriend, and if he did, she was replaced every few months by just another random black actress, because there was no commitment at all. Well, uh, well, also, I mean, it was, it's interesting going from show to show with the black characters on soaps, because they often... So, like, in, like for example, on Young and the Restless, you had... Like, that show, if you look at the black characters on that show, it's most known for the sort of years-long quadrangle of Neil, Olivia, Malcolm, and Drusilla. Mm -hmm. And Drusilla being sort of like, I would say probably the, one of the most popular characters that had ever been on that show. Yeah. Um, but like, even, and, and they sort of were like this kind of um, upper, mid to upper class quadrangle, or they became that, but what, but what I found in my research is that, like, Trusilla's character started off as, like, this kind of, like, illiterate, ragamuffin, homeless girl off the street who shows up at her aunt Mamie. Mamie. Mm -hmm. Mamie. Yep. Mamie. Who is a maid Mamie. in the, the Abbott household. Yeah. And, like, and, and I just, and, and so there's, and there's so many times, like, uh, ways in which you look at the history of these soaps and these, a lot of these black characters that, Kind of have these kind of really odd representations of black characters that then, because of the nature of soap opera, stories can change, and like Drusilla can go from being like homeless, illiterate girl off the street to like being vice president of Jabot Cosmetics or wherever yeah. she ended up, Major in, international conglomerate, or yeah. whatever yeah. I mean, it was, and like, and, but the, but that that story itself to me speaks to a kind of fantasy about black excellence, representation, et cetera. It is very, it's a fantasy, and that actually weirdly is a big part of what the show is actually about, because also, because like, you know, on Soaps, one minute, uh, Abe's wife, Lexi, was a doctor, and then she was like a cop. She was a cop. Well, maybe she was a cop. And then she, she became a, a doctor. Became a doctor. A she month. had an affair yeah. with his brother, Theo. Theo. Yeah. Um, or no, I thought it was... Jonah. Jonah. It was Jonah. Because yeah, yeah. Jonah, Jonah was, was the, the, yeah. the, the, the vigilante. Yeah, he became a street vigilante. Yeah, yeah. And then, but then she's revealed to be biracial, and she's Stefano Demira's daughter. And like, it's just... And there's something about the metaphor of how soaps can change your life. And, how, and, and watching black characters sort of okay. in the midst of that... Oh, sorry. Just gotta move my knees. Sorry. Okay, keep going. Watching sort of black characters in the midst of that, mm -hmm. I just, there was just something about, I wanted to play with that. Yeah. Um, what was interesting was the performance I was at 
Keisha, the lead character, gets replaced between the first act and the second act. Oh, yeah. And, and I didn't know if that was part that of wasn't the part message. Of, that because... wasn't part of the story. That was like the actor had gotten ill. Oh, okay. So, I felt bad because it's like, I didn't know if she was ill or if that was a commentary about no. how I mean, that would have been amazing. always being replaced. That would have been amazing if I thought to build television. that into it, but okay. no. But okay. that, but that, you know, that was just a after illness. Oh, but... I'm so sorry. Okay, I thought that was like, that was in the message. Oh, Because no. again, at least on the NBC shows. Yeah. The central characters, as you said. Yeah, but that, did happen. but that did happen on, yeah. on days when, because I remember Mark Voorhees played Wendy, mm -hmm. and then he was recast as somebody else. They always, you know, again, there were like five Lexis before right. the one who yeah, eventually yeah. came and, and uh, Deborah Brooks, who, who took it. Or, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Renee Jones, right, who, who, yeah. who really took the role steadily. But there had been like every few months, there had been a new I Lexi. And oh, I didn't realize that. I only was aware of Renee. Yeah, the first one was Cindy Gossett Jr. Oh, interesting. In uh, 87. Oh, that's so funny. And, but NBC was about Marlena Evans, Vicki Hudson, Eden Capwell. Right. The black women were always on the side. That's right. Supportive. But then, but often when they were on the side, they would still be kind of um, assistant district attorney. Mm -hmm. Or like something. Judge, judge lawyer, lawyer doctor. Like, but it wasn't like, you would never have a character who occupied the same space as Erica Kane. Right. Or Deirdre Evans. Or Marlon Evans. Right. Or Barbara Ryan. Right. Or Rita Shane. Like it was... It was very, or it was very rare until Drusilla came along. Yeah, Drusilla was like as a kind of an outlier character in that way, and I think that's a in a large part because of Victoria Rowell. Yeah, who was just such a dynamic performer, and also like he as a person it was like demanded to yeah. be seen, which ultimately led to her leaving the show. Right. And I know, like, I was not a huge fan of Passions either. Right. We were not being... But well, we I did was, appreciate... I, I was, I was um, loyal to Another World. Yeah. When I got canceled, I just could never get into... I, yeah. I refused to get into Passions. So you weren't monogamous. I'm polyamorous. So I could, I could easily... I mean, just, I was polyamorous, but <laughs> Another sober. World was, like, was my yeah. show. And so I just felt like I can't... I can't give I can't give that energy yeah. to passions. But the one thing I give passions credit for is that the black family was central to the premise and stayed central. Yeah, and they the also had like nine year run. And they also had like very really crazy storylines with them, like with Virginia and that turkey based her. Virginia and Vanessa. Right. And like and the, the, the brother yeah. and the incest. But but right. the thing is the black family was included and central to every all the craziness that was going right. on. The That's, supernatural stuff, sure. the witches, the dolls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For better or for worse, right. um, that was a show that really... But that wasn't until 1999. That's right. Now they've just announced that there's going to be yeah, a I heard new it, daytime I heard it, show. I heard about this, and yeah. I'm very curious like, what that will be. Would you ever consult or write if they ever came to you and asked you? So I've been asked this before. Um, Is it okay? Um, I've been asked this before, um, and I think my answer is no, okay. because... The production values and the sort of the the tone and the sort of style is like so different today than it was when I was watching shows. Like you can't be as outrageous on daytime as you used to be. Mm. And I just like that's what I loved about it. And also the pacing is different. And so like you have to do everything like very, very quickly. Yeah. And it can't you can't take your time. Like I remember and I, didn't even, I wasn't even watching the show when it was on, but because of YouTube, you can watch a lot of old episodes. Like, on Guiding Light, they had a storyline where Alexandra took, like, a year to, like, get revenge on Roger Thorpe because he was sleeping with Mindy Lewis. And, and watching those scenes and the way they play out, it was like you were watching, a, like, a play. Yeah. And I was a big fan of the shows when they had that kind of pacing. And it yeah. wasn't, like just quick turnover. And so I don't, I mean, I guess it would depend on if somehow they're going to do it differently, but I feel like the production values also, um, and the acting and the music and like, there's just, there's just a whole, um, style to the shows that I, that I think it's just, it's of a, a bygone era. Wow. Yeah. 
I agree. But I mean, I'll, I'm certainly curious to see what it is. Yeah. Whenever it happens. Well, I do think that when people listen to and hopefully get the soundtrack to White Girl in Danger, mm-hmm. um, they can also hear your appreciation for soaps and oh, yeah. an array of great music. Yeah, really, yeah. really great music. I mean, I wrote in the story. Yeah, I wrote the music very methodically to feel like you're in the style and in the era of of those shows whether it was daytime or prime time um i i've i've i studied like the sound of, of those worlds and the, and so there's a lot of also 80s 90s pop set 70s 80s and 90s pop kind of feel to a lot of it um that's about placing you in a specific milieu so love it and, and i think the album i'm very very proud of the album so i hope that people Go and check it out. And it just got released. So yes. by the time people watch so this, wherever, it'll be on there. It's on Apple. It's on yeah, iTunes. It's wherever, on wherever you uh, get music, if you're so inclined to buy the album, as people uh-huh. used to do in the old days, uh-huh. um, that would be great. But yeah, wherever you get music, you can listen to it. And now, right now, you've got a whole other show going on mm-hmm. called Teeth. That's right. And Teeth is... Which I just saw, by the way. Yes. It's, it's, an, ad, it's an adaptation of the 2007 film of the same name. Uh-huh. And it's about a teen girl, Ethan who's in bed, who's evangelical, who discovers that she has teeth in her vagina. And sort of madness ensues from there. What amazed me, I'm not going to give anything away, but what amazed me about the show was that I know you started writing this, formulating this in 2009. Yeah, with my collaborator and co-book writer, Anna K. James. And that some of the themes of the show Mm -hmm. have sadly manifested into politics in terms of men dominating women's bodies and trying to tell women what they should and should not do with their bodies. Yeah, so a big part of the show for Anna and I is that the real sort of villain of the of the musical is ideology, and a lot of it is patriarchal ideology, but that's not only the only ideology. But that and that the way that that can invade everyone and everyone can sort of start operating from this idea of like men do this and women do that and what that creates in people. And once again, a theme in your work is the way that religion can literally kill people. Like, sexuality yeah. and pleasure can be yeah, that, punished. In right, that. exactly. And that was, like, you know, my in into even wanting to adapt it um, with Anna uh, was that I just... Religion, religion and sexuality clashing and not being able to coexist is, like, a, a, a theme that I'm so fascinated with and it's so present in the original movie. And I just wanted to sort of play with that on an even deeper level in the musical. And do you see yourself in any of the characters in Teeth? I've been telling people, while I am not a teen evangelical with teeth in my vagina, spiritually I am. So I see myself, <laughs> I see myself in Dawn. Uh-huh. Um, the, the, the main stru- character. The main who character. A teeth in her vagina. Yeah, who's struggling with like her, desi- her sexual desires and her desire to to remain faithful to God. Wow. And so, and what, you know, again, people are familiar, not spoiler alert, but she ends up, you know, with teeth in her vagina, she ends up killing her, her partners and... Many, yeah. Having there's to a learn. whole... There's a whole spree. Wow. Oh my gosh, Michael. I'm so grateful to you. Your whole body of work that's there, I know there's so much ahead and I cannot wait to see what you're doing. I'm going to double check my cheat sheet because I have like a million questions, which I think I did answer, but I just... Oh, okay. The last question I have. You, The 20 years, the span, the highs and lows, what makes you feel most alive today? What makes me feel most alive today is still, you know, making art and music. Um, I think my favorite moments are when we are in the middle of rehearsal and like the actors and the director and all of us are figuring out um, how to to tell a story that still makes me feel the most excited, even more than actually having the show up because it's it's like a private moment of like artistic exploration and and building and I think that brings me a lot of joy. Wonderful. If you could go back 20 years and give that 22 year old Michael a piece of advice, what would it be? I would um, tell him to relax. 
Are you doing that now and more, more often? Um, I'm doing it a lot more. There's still room for growth, but Great. yeah. Well, I again so value your time and really the journey that you've shared of living your life, the struggles, but being where you at to where you know yourself today, you know your power, you know your center better. Still a journey, right? right? But you have a better compass for who you are, what you're willing to have in your life, the way you're willing to be treated and not treated. Right. Um, that you just know yourself so much clearer. And I think that is really the infrastructure that gives us a sense of, um, I think, fun in life that allows us to experience the good things, the sad things, right. but to still have a compass of knowing who we are. That's really the gift. Yeah. So I want to thank you for coming out here, sure. sitting in my tub. How is this feeling now? Um, uh, it's pretty good. It's like, it's a, a once in a lifetime kind of thing. I don't know. No one will ever ask me to do this again, I don't think. Well, I may ask you to do this again. Okay. So, so we'll to see you later but right. even if this is the only time i'm so grateful i love talking with you every time we do get a chance to to say hello mm -hmm. um and i just want to thank you for putting out this wonderful entertainment undercover art important messaging about sociology sexuality religion social justice and just getting to know and deepen our strength of who we are as human beings i feel like that is something your work offers to all of us Thank you, I appreciate you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Oh, if people want to keep following you, seeing your work, seeing what's going on, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, I'm pretty... You can find me on Instagram, at the living Michael Jackson, on Twitter, or X, whatever. <laughs> I never will call it X. Um, at the living MJ. I have a website, thelivingmichaeljackson.com. I'm probably going to, like, take a little bit of a social media break come the fall, but... I'm, I'm contactable. Okay, okay. And if you like this interview, you can subscribe down below. There's like 140 interviews of tubs of artists, entertainers, healers, leaders, people learning how to get through life and express themselves in life. Um, there's certain, there will be an archive of old episodes down below if you're watching this on YouTube. And I hope if certain things are interesting to you, check out Michael's work, listen to his music, listen to the messaging. It's so much fun and interesting and certainly a source of conversation one can have with their friends in yeah, their tubs sure. or their pools or wherever the people have conversations with their, with their friends about these topics. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. All right, everybody. Have a great day.